Thanks, Peter, and, and thank you for inviting me to talk today. It's a real pleasure to be here. I feel like I should sort of have a disclaimer at the start of my presentation to say that this is going to be quite data heavy. Um, but being mindful of the discussions that we had earlier around language, I hope I'll be able to kind of take you all along with me. Um, so as Peter said, I'm going to talk about some work that I've done with the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. I would like to acknowledge my supervisors, Matt Maddox, Catherine Sleeman and Fliss Murta, and also um, the Dunhill Medical Trust who have funded my PhD. So before I go on to talk about the work that we've done with ELSA, I wanted to start with a kind of more general look at um, some of the evidence on the social determinants of health. So this is the Marmot curve that I know many of you will be familiar with. So it plots age against um, income deprivation and each of the little green dots is a neighbourhood in England. So the top part of the scatter, the light green dots there that you're seeing at the top of the graph represent life expectancy and the darker green scatter towards the lower part of the graph represents disability free life expectancy. What it shows is that if you live in a more deprived area, you, or if, if you live in the most deprived area, you die, die on average seven years earlier than people who live in the least deprived areas. But probably more worryingly, people who live in the most deprived areas experience the onset of um, disability 17 years earlier than people who live in the least deprived areas. And Marmot makes two important points about this graph. The first is that it's a gradient, there's a social gradient. So social inequality in health is not just a problem for people at the very bottom, um, for the very poorest people in society. It's a problem for everybody below those at the very top of society. And the second important point he makes is that it's not inevitable. The causes of social inequality in health are economic. The conditions in which we're born, live, work and age are critically important to our health. In the more recent Marmot report that was published in 2020, a really worrying trend has emerged. Life expectancy has started to actually stall. Within this, the gap between the rich and, and the poorest has grown, and most worryingly for women in the, for, for women in the very poorest group, life expectancy has actually started to decline. And throughout the report, Marmot very cautiously but plausibly demonstrates how a decade of austerity, huge reductions in public funding, the housing crisis, the increase in precarious employment have worsened health overall and have increased health inequalities. So obviously this data is for England, but there's a similar pattern of stalling life expectancy across the four nations. And then when I was preparing for this talk today, I had a look at the um, evidence for Ireland. Now this is all cause mortality um, in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland separated by social class or socio-economic group. And you can see that very familiar pattern of a social gradient. So this is a global phenomenon, but throughout all of these reports, um, these national and international reports on the social determinants of health, end of life is rarely, if ever, mentioned. But we know that there is social inequality in end of life care, and we know it particularly in relation to place of death. So this was a study that we did a few years ago, looking at the deprivation profile of people who die in hospices in England. What it shows is that you've always been more likely to die in a hospice if you live in a less deprived area. But the gap between the richest and the poorest areas has grown by 25% over the last 20 years. So we were interested in trying to understand whether this picture that we saw um, in relation to place of death in England played out in other countries and in relation to other end of life outcomes. So we did a systematic review where we combined all of the data from any study that presented any measure of socioeconomic position against a range of different um, outcomes at the end of life. 
We found consistent evidence that in high income countries, people with low socioeconomic position are more likely to die in hospital. They're more likely to have hospital admissions in the last months of life, and they're less likely to receive specialist palliative care. And in relation to death in hospital and not receiving specialist palliative care, we were also able to demonstrate this social gradient. And the strength of this evidence is really in combining data from lots of different studies um, to be able to show this social gradient. So I became really interested in understanding why this social inequality exists. And I came across lots of studies in different areas of health that used something called mediation analysis to understand more about the mechanisms this, behind inequality. Um, and the idea behind mediation analysis is actually quite simple. So in a traditional regression analysis, we're interested in the relationship between an exposure and an outcome. And we want to control the effect, control for the effect of confounders, things that are associated with both the exposure and the outcome. In mediation analysis, we ask how much of the effect of the exposure is explained by a mediating factor. So a mediator is not just a confounder of the relationship between the exposure and the outcome, it actually sits on the causal pathway from the exposure to the outcome. The exposure causes the mediator, which in turn causes the outcome. And this is a type of structural equation modeling, and it's sometimes referred to as path analysis. So this is the paper that we wrote using that method. And all of the um, code that underlies the analysis, if you're interested in the kind of technical elements of it, is all available on GitHub. So the data that we used um, is from the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, which, which is a large and ongoing observational cohort study. It's nationally representative of people aged 50 and over living in England, and it collects data on the health and social situation of people as they age. So when a participant in ELSA dies, there's an end of life interview with a proxy interviewee, which asks about the final years of life. So we carried out a secondary analysis of the data um, held in ELSA on the deceased participants. ELSA is a freely available uh, research resource and it's part of the family of ageing studies that includes TILDA in Ireland and also the HRS in America. So something to mention about our sample is that we excluded people who had an admission to a care home in the last two years of life. And that's because admission to a care home is an important potential modifier of the relationship between socioeconomic position and hospital based care, because care home admissions potentially reduce hospital admissions for all residents, regardless of socioeconomic position. But in ELSA, our sample of care home residents is too small and not representative enough to investigate this fully. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more later on about how we addressed um, this exclusion of this group in a sensitivity analysis. Oops. Okay, so the aim of the study was to investigate potential pathways between socioeconomic position and the receipt of hospital based care towards the end of life. There's no dominant theory that we could set out to test, um, but from the existing evidence, we identified three potential pathways that could be tested using the ELSA data. So the first pathway is through health and function. There's strong evidence from the global literature on health inequalities, including the Marmot work that I spoke about earlier, that people with lower socioeconomic position experience more disability and disease. And so we hypothesize that as a result, they might have a higher need for hospital based care at the end of life. The second pathway is through access to services. Evidence suggests that people with lower socioeconomic position may access elective, primary and social care services less and therefore use hospital based care more. And the third pathway through social support 
there's some evidence to suggest that the informal support systems that are essential for keeping people at home and out of hospital in the last months and years of life may be weaker amongst people with lower socioeconomic position. So this is a more detailed version of the structural model that we developed. Each of the straight arrows is a regression line and the two curved lines are covariances or correlations. So we've got the two binary outcomes on the right hand side of the model, death in hospital versus death at home or hospice. And the second outcome, having three or more hospital admissions in the last two years of life versus, versus having two or fewer admissions. So these are both proxy reported after the death. Then we've got the two exposures of socioeconomic position on the left of the model, education and wealth, both, both taken at baseline when the participants entered the ELSA study. Education is something that's usually fixed in early adulthood. We measured it in five hierarchical categories. And you can see in the model that education is allowed to influence wealth. And wealth is really a measure of assets accumulated across the life course. We used wealth in deciles, and it's based on a really detailed set of measures available in ELSA that includes a sum of savings, investments, physical wealth, housing wealth, and debt. And we've got the three mediators in the middle there, which I've already described, each modelled as a latent factor, which means that several items or questions contributed to each of these mediators. And the mediators were measured on average 15 months before death. Um, and then age at death and gender were confounders allowed to influence both the mediators and the outcomes. And we used M plus, which is a software specifically designed for structural equation modeling to carry out this analysis. Um, and in a preliminary analysis, we looked at each of the regressions separately, controlling for age and gender. And in the case of the exposures, we mutually adjusted for wealth and education. Then we ran three separate mediation models, one for each of the mediators. And then for the final model, we modeled all of the mediators simultaneously in something that's referred to as a multiple mediator model. So these are the stages of analysis, which I've already described. So some of the technical points about the model, we report probit coefficients, which if like me, you're more used to dealing with logits and odds ratios, um, just threw me initially and I had to get my head around how to interpret these probit co coefficients. It's a feature of the type of estimator that we used in M plus. Um, that reports these probit coefficients. So they can't be translated or tra transferred into odds ratios. So we can interpret them in terms of their direction, their magnitude and their significance. And we can turn them into probabilities to help us to understand the meaning of the results. Something to mention about the missing data. The ELSA data is um, a really high quality data resource and missing data was low for most of the variables. But on our latent social support variable, we had 26% um, missing data. So we used multiple imputation to address that missing data. Um, and we also looked at how the model that we produced was moderated by age, because we know from other studies that the effect of socioeconomic position on health can diminish at older age. Okay, so let's look at some of the results. So 38% of deceased ELSA participants have an end of life proxy interview. And after we'd excluded those participants who had um, an admission to a care home in the last two years of life, we were left with 737 participants. 43% were women, 44% were 80 or older, and it was an overwhelmingly white sample, 97% white. 61% died in hospital, 30% at home, 9% in hospice, and 25% had three or more admissions in the last two years of life. So the two outcomes, um, the distribution of the two outcomes was kind of broadly representative of um, the distribution in the wider population. 
Okay, so let's have a look at the model. These numbers at the bottom are telling us about model fit. Um, for those that are interested in um, model fit, though it was good or adequate, um, which, which means that we're kind of okay to go on to interpretate, interpret the um, paths that we um, estimated in our model. So I'm just going to highlight the statistically significant paths. And just a reminder that the coefficients are probits and not logits. Okay, so looking at the paths from exposures to outcomes, higher wealth had a negative effect on death in hospital. So people with higher wealth were less likely to die in hospital. And that's shown by the blue line. All of the other direct effects from exposures to outcomes were non-significant. In the preliminary single path analysis, wealth also had a direct negative effect on admissions, but not in this final model. Higher education had an expected relatively strong positive effect on wealth. Higher wealth had a positive effect on better health and better access to services, but no effect on social support. And better health had a negative effect on admissions. People with better health had fewer admissions, but none of the mediators affected death in hospital. Better health and function had a positive effect on access to services, and there was a significant positive covariance between both the outcomes and between access to services and social support. So in summary, the direct effect of wealth on death in hospital was not mediated by any of the pathways that we tested. The effect of wealth on, ad on admissions that existed in our preliminary analysis was mediated by the pathway through health and function, with this pathway accounting for 34% of the total effect of wealth on, ad on admissions. And in this final model, the relationship between wealth and admissions was no longer significant. And we found that education affected the mediators and the outcomes only indirectly via wealth. This is the moderation plot of the interaction between wealth and age on death in hospital. It's plotting the direct effect of wealth on death in hospital at different ages, along with the 95% confidence interval. Um, and it shows that the negative direct effect of wealth on death in hospital that we found in our model weakens with older age and is not significant at age 85 and above and also not significant for the very youngest in the sample. So if we look at this in terms of probabilities, for the youngest participants, the probability of death in hospital was around 69% for the most deprived and 38% for the least deprived. But you can see that this gap is much smaller at older ages. We also looked at how the effect of wealth on health was moderated by age, and it showed a similar moderation effect. The positive effect of wealth on health in our final model diminished at older ages and was non-significant from age 87 onwards. So just briefly to uh, go into the sensitivity analysis, we did a bootstrapped model on the non-imputed data and found that the results were consistent with the main results we reported. Um, when we included those residents who'd had uh, the participants who'd had a admission to a care home in the last two years of life we found that the effects of wealth on death in hospital were attenuated which lends some support to um, the idea that care home admission might act as a moderator of that relationship um, and we also did a sensitivity analysis where we adjusted the effects of the outcome uh, on the outcome for cancer cause of death and separately for diagnosis of depression. Because in our model we treated health as a mediator on the pathway from socioeconomic position to care, we didn't want to additionally control for specific diagnoses because there'd be too much overlap with our latent measure of health. But it was actually one of the reviewers of um, the paper who suggested that we needed to consider the confounding effect of diagnosis. 
So we decided to do this in a sensitivity analysis. And when we adjusted for diagnosis, we found that the effects of wealth on death in hospital remained, but they were attenuated, which suggests that the model might look different for different subgroups based on diagnosis. Um, but across different diagnoses, you would expect the effect of wealth to remain. So in conclusion, in this sample of deceased older adults in England, people with lower wealth had more hospital admissions in part because they have worse health and function. And this challenges a tendency to seek behavioral exp explanations for different patterns of care. The idea that more deprived people choose to use acute services more. Instead, our results emphasize the importance of health need in driving greater use of hospital care amongst people with lower socioeconomic position. The recent um, pandemic that we've all been living through has brought the link between social factors and health into sharp focus. And this, the findings from this study feeds into the wider work on social determinants of health and should strengthen awareness amongst health professionals and commissioners of the related risk factors of low wealth and poor health for use of hospital services towards the end of life. The relationship between wealth and death in hospital was not explained by any of the mediators tested in this study. This study was really a first attempt to empirically test different mediators. We definitely need more work with different data sets, different measures, different mediators, and we should continue to try to investigate how wealth and asset ownership drives this relationship um, between deprivation and place of death. Methodologically, the study makes a case for accounting for the mediating effect of health rather than just controlling for it as a confounder, particularly when uh, researchers are interested in looking at this relationship between socioeconomic position and care. And then something else that came out from this study, which has been echoed in lots of studies about the social determinants of health, is that the way that we measure socioeconomic position is important. Um, wealth is a measure that is closer in time to our outcomes than something like education, which is kind of fixed much earlier on in the life course. Um, so we need to be careful about the way that we measure socioeconomic position as well. So some limitations of the work. We had um, lots of measurement issues. ELSA is a fantastic data resource, but whenever you're working with a kind of secondary analysis, you're limited by the data that you, that you have. So we, the outcomes that we worked with, for example, we looked at admissions in the last two years of life, and that's a longer period than you would normally consider end of life. Um, and of course, we dealt with place of death as a binary, um, which assumes that hospital death is always a bad outcome, which um, is obviously limited um, for lots of reasons. The mediators that we used might not have been able to capture the most important aspects. Um, they were, the mediators were measured on average 15 months before death. So um, being able to capture mediators closer to death might be important, but also the things that they actually tap. So our social support measure looked at um, the quality of relationships with um, children, family and friends. And those issues might, those elements might not be the most important um, aspects to the social support that people receive in the last months of life. So although we didn't find that social support was an important mediator, um, it's really important to kind of look at different ways of measuring that. Um, we had missing data and small effect sizes, which might limit the power in the model. Um, the data that we were working with is um, becoming increasingly out of date. At the time when I wrote the study, um, the update to the ELSA study in terms of death, so the, the ELSA study is informed about the death of participants by linking to mortality data um, and that linkage hadn't been done since 2012 when I wrote the study um, which also means that end-of-life proxy interviews weren't being issued either so um, there's, an, there's an issue around the update of that data 
And a major limitation is the um, lack of diversity in the sample. 97% of participants were white. Um, so that's, that's a, a limitation of the data set generally. And then this issue of unmeasured confounders, which is always a concern for mediation studies, um, trying to kind of capture all of the potential confounders. Um, and that's obviously very difficult in, in a secondary analysis. So preferences for care and local service provision were two that we identified as, as major potential unmeasured confounders. Um, but there will be lots of others that aren't included in the model. So some future question, questions that are at the forefront of my mind are what other mediators might be important? Housing quality is something that we, we spoke about earlier. We know how important housing quality is to health generally, and also how important housing is at the end of life and how the role of community and home care is, is increasing. So understanding how housing quality might mediate the relationship between socioeconomic position and um, place of death and other patterns of care at the end of life, I think is, is really important. Um, there are also different ways that we can measure social support and services um, and lots of questions around that. This question about how ethnicity can moderate um, the relationships that we've seen in the model, I think is another really important one. And also questions around how pathways might differ for different conditions. So for example, could worse health and function actually protect against terminal admission in some conditions such as cancer? So I just want to finish by returning to um, Michael Marmot and the three principles of action that he set out in his 2008 report for the WHO into global health inequalities. So this was like a, a really a sort of call, a call to action. And, and the first two points are to improve the conditions of daily life and to tackle um, inequitable distribution of power. And I think sometimes in palliative and end of life care, we kind of feel like our hands are tied, particularly in relation to trying to um, influence structural problems that drive social inequality in health. But this final point, the need to measure the problem, evaluate action, expand the knowledge base, develop a workforce that is trained in the social determinants of health and raise public awareness about the social determinants of health, I think is, is really important for us. So I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. I read those um, papers when they came out and again in preparation for uh, this morning, but uh, still nevertheless in, was still interested and um, uh, surprised by some of the, the power of some of your findings. It really is outstanding work and congratulations on it. Um, I have uh, been monitoring the Q&A and I think we're just hoping that questions will start coming in now, but while uh, people are typing their questions into the box, I'll um, make a start for us. So one of the things that I was wondering about as I was looking at it is the, sort of the question of modifiability. So you started off by talking about the Marmot curve and that all inequities are in principle modifiable because if we have sort of an even distribution of resources, then we wouldn't see these inequities. But given that a lot of the inequities that we see at end of life are cumulative across the life course, for, a, for an, an, a forum such as this, where we're primarily interested in palliative and end of life care, have you given much thought to what are the, the, the strategies, the policies that we should be thinking about to mitigate some of these trends in, in a palliative end of life care population? Yeah, I think that's the really, really difficult challenge. Um, and some of the things that we were talking about earlier in relation uh, to what Sam Royston was saying about access to benefits are, you know, really important for kind of changing people's daily lives. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done uh, around that. Um, but I think we also really need to be a bit better at kind of evaluating um, how things play out for different groups. So, you know, typically in um, randomized control trials and in lots of studies, 
marginalised groups don't appear in those studies at all. And I think if we really seriously want to try and address inequality, we've got to try to include those groups in our research and think about ways um, that we can reach all of the different subgroups of our, of our communities that we serve. So that, that sort of touches on another thought that I had, like you, I'm, um, although I was fascinated by this morning's session and the personal input, I'm really a sort of a large data person as, as well. And so one question I was wondering all of the way through is if you could have one additional piece of data or one domain or an indicator of deprivation or an outcome of experience or but perhaps it is access to these to these different populations. What is the thing that you think is missing from your data that you would most like? Mm. Am I allowed to have more than one? Um, yeah, I suppose <laughs> I should have I should have thought this through more clearly on a kind of desert island discs uh, premise. But uh, yeah, as long as let, let's keep it to three, let's say. <laughs> I mean, from a kind of um, routine data perspective, the two big gaping holes in our um, data resources. Um, in the UK are the lack of data or the lack of national data on primary care and then of course the lack of data on social care. So the first one is probably slightly easier fixed um, and, and you know I, I can see a, a place maybe in five or ten years time where we do have a national um, data set on primary care and um, the data on social care given how fragmented these services are that that deliver that care is a is a much bigger challenge i think um i think you know there there are various groups like the health foundation who have a kind of battery of different outcomes looking at inequality in health and i think that that kind of thing is is really useful and we could adopt a similar thing in palliative and end of life care and try to put our heads together with patient groups as well as clinicians and big data researchers to come up with a set of um, inequality outcomes that we're interested in monitoring over the next few years and ultimately interested in in trying to kind of reduce. Um, so I think that would be a really interesting piece of work. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure I've, slight, I've slightly gone in a different direction, but hopefully that answers your question partly. No, that's great, thank you. So I, we have a question now um, in the chat from Professor Sheila Payne and uh, Sheila says, thank you for your presentation. Can you say anything more about strategies that focus on personal behaviours versus structural and social responses? Thanks, Sheila. I, th I think that's a, a really important question. I think um, there used to be quite a strong emphasis in the social determinants on ha on, of health on um, behaviours. Um, and I think that shift is rightly focusing um, away from that now um, towards more structural um, changes that, that need to take place. I mean, I think the, the kind of um, sort of blame culture of, um, of trying to um, explain social inequalities based purely on individual behaviours is, is wrong, probably, and um, we need much more attention on um, the larger structural contextual issues that shape people's lives. Um, and I think there is a kind of um, much bigger momentum around that in recent years. Okay. Um, we, the next question is from uh, George Kernahan, who says there's a very interesting detailed study um, in, in, on the issue of modifiability. Um, how can we gather possible interventions to address inequity in the longer term? What about harnessing community support more effectively? So I suppose that's a question around the role of public health and community type interventions in addressing some of these inequities. Yeah, I mean, I think there's been some really interesting work with the compassionate communities, which I'm sure that lots of people will be familiar with. Um, and I think um, it, it is right that it, it, the responsibility to kind of 
reduce inequality in end of life care doesn't doesn't sit with just one group. It's um it's definitely a community and public health issue as much as it's an issue for specialist palliative care. The, the one question that has been raised is about the, the limitation on um, diversity and the fact that your sample is 97% white. So well, first, let's um, get our own house in order in Ireland. Tilda doesn't even collect data on ethnicity because our sample is so overwhelmingly white. And that will, of course, change in, in time because our younger population is more diverse. But I don't really have a sense among among people who are dying in England or older people who are dying in England, like how how unrepresentative is that? Like how is 97% white? How far from the population statistics is that? Um, oh, put, put me on the spot now. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it is hugely underrepresented, right. um, underrepresentative of ethnic minorities. Um, so I was look and, and it really varies by area. I was looking at the... Um, data from the census um, earlier this week and actually you know there are some areas in London some small neighborhoods I was I looked specifically at um, an area in London called Newham and they have an absolutely huge proportion of ethnic minorities more than 80 percent of um, people who responded to the census um, were classified as an ethnic minority and then you know, at the other end of things, you have much, much lower numbers. So I think that it's around 20, 30 percent of the overall population um, is an ethnic minority. Um, somebody I'm sure will be able to Google that now and correct me. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it's hugely um, white sample in Elsa, which which is which has always been a limitation of the work. But there are other data sets that we could use to look at this. So talking about the census, there's something called the census longitudinal study, which links a 1% uh, sample of people who respond to the census over successive years of census, but also to their death records. Um, and in that way, you can get a much larger sample of ethnic minorities and start to look at this um, cumulative effect of social disadvantage and ethnicity. Um, and I think that is, is going to be a really important thing to do um, for the future parts of this work. Okay, great. Um, I think that we are, um, yes, we're up to the end of the questions here. We have about, oh, one just coming in. Um, so uh, Joanne Droney says, thank you for a wonderful presentation uh, with powerful data. Um, at the Royal Marsden Hospital in London, they're carrying out research on the impact of advanced care planning on end of life outcomes. Early data suggests that those engagements do affect end of life, um, end of life outcomes. And so have you, you, I suppose, referring to this, referring to this morning's panel discussion about individual patient preferences, promotion of ACP in conjunction with other interventions may bring about meaningful change is that something that you've been thinking about yeah i mean i think all of these interventions are probably more likely um to be taken up and be um available to people who are less deprived so in the same way that you're more likely to get access to a hospice if you're less deprived you're probably more likely to get access to advanced care plans if you're um if you're less deprived, sorry. Um, so I think it's, re it's really important when we're looking at these interventions to think about how we can reach more marginalized groups and to evaluate whether, um, whether, we're, be whether we're able to, to reach people equitably. I think that's one of the things about um, health advances, like you know the classic one is the reduction in smoking um, over the last you know, 20, 30 years, um, that's been something that's been much more beneficial to people who are less deprived than to, than to people who are more deprived. So I think we do always need to be mindful about um, how interventions are taken up um, across the different parts of society. Yeah, so that's I know. I think we have about three minutes left before I need to hand over to Cloda. So if anybody has a final question, please um, speak now or forever hold your peace. 
And I suppose, I mean, that, that touches on something, yes, around the, the you had in your conclusion around sort of treatment of heterogeneity. So that's something that's been a lot of people are interested in that you could see, for example, different effects of palliative care by diagnosis groups and by illness and, and things like and things like that. And so that you can have these mediating effects. There's the great, there's along the lines of your smoking point, there's that excellent study from America about childhood obesity and the standard response to childhood obesity is, oh, well, they should get more exercise and perhaps they should walk to school. But actually the poorest children in America already walk to school because they don't have a car and they, uh, they can't afford the bus, but they still have the highest rates of obesity. You can't walk your way out of poverty. And um, so, I mean, that's a profound challenge then is the design of is that the uh, the people for whom the largest effects will be found might be those you know who, who we're least concerned about in this in this discussion um and so in i don't know then so yes in the context of advanced care planning does that mean that just means taking the time to tailor interventions to the to the sort of the individual and community needs. Are we back a little bit where we were in this morning's conversation? Do you think around the need to be more responsive and pluralistic in the way we think about palliative end of life care? Yeah, I think I think that's a really important point. Um, the idea that interventions might actually increase inequalities rather than decrease them. And I think unless you pay specific attention to how they can decrease inequalities, there's always the risk that they might increase them. Um, I think advanced care planning is a really important one that, that like um, Joanne said, has a real potential to reduce inequalities if it can reach the right people. Okay, I think we're not getting a further question, so I'll take the final question before we pass over to Clover, and that is you outlined some of the things um, that you're thinking about looking at next within within your data. And, um, as Suzanne introduced earlier, we have, you know, have a big network here of palliative researchers on the island of Ireland. And so um, what, what do you think, what do you think thinking outside of the data you have more generally in this area, are there any particular pointers or priorities that you would encourage this group to be thinking of as uh, in their research as we look to tackle these issues in future? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's repeating really the point that Sam Royster made at the end of his talk. I think this issue around housing is, is really important. Um, you know, there's more people are dying at home than ever before and even pre-pandemic that was a trend that um was increasing and um, community care is so important but the houses that people live in you know we all know how important our our homes are to us um and some of those really really quite shocking and you know um emotional kind of statistics that um, Sam was talking about earlier about the number of people in fuel poverty. I think we've, we've really got to try to understand um, the housing situation much more and how that impacts people's health, people's lives and the ability for people to stay at home um, towards the end of life. Okay, that's great. Well, that actually works up nicely for the afternoon as well when I know we're going to see some um, data on the cost of home modifications near the end of life in Tilda, which are uh, which one of the more interesting things we found when we dug around in that data. So that really is a fantastic word, Joanna. Thank you so much for the presentation and the Q&A um, today. And we, we look forward to seeing what comes next.